Okay, uh, welcome everyone for the Friday on our seminar series by iHub on technology. <coughs> so we have today Sebastian Booster, I think some of you guys know him. He is in uh, Isabel So we know each other since uh, long years. years. So he has done a uh, PhD in ANU, Australia. And then there was in PKS where we met for the first time. And uh, after that, uh, it's quite a long time in Isabel now. Okay, so okay yeah, thank you very much. Also, yeah, thanks for the chance here to talk to you guys and the invitation. It's nice to be back. So, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, quantum solitons, and I'll try to explain you like step by step what first what the soliton is, what's quantum about is, and why collisions might be interesting. Everything I'll talk about is essentially the PhD thesis project of Apana, who just recently graduated, and then she had some support from master students and postdocs. And my entire endeavor in these quantum soliton collisions, or the original idea that there might be something very interesting to look at there, is thanks to Matthew Davis at the University of Queensland, where I was for some short postdoctoral stint in between all these things that uh, Regis just said. So solitons are a type of nonlinear wave that uh, distinguishes itself by the fact that it doesn't disperse. Right, so here on the top, you see just a normal Gaussian wave packet of any kind. And you all know that this is made up out of lots of different, say, cosine or sine oscillations that all have a different phase velocity in a typical medium. And because of that, this flows apart and disperses. Right, so it does not retain its shape. Right, that's a sort of standard scenario that you would have in a linear system with some dispersion. Right, so now as early as in 1834, in some kind of water, like narrow water canals, people have observed this special shape of water wave that sometimes happens to propagate without actually dispersing like that. Right, and these are called solitary waves. So here are sort of two animations of, of that. You see it's moving around, but it's perfectly retaining its shape. Right, and I'll explain you shortly why this happens. They, they, I mean, the, the short version of why it happens is because of nonlinearities in the system, right? So essentially, you need any nonlinear medium to sustain these, and there's many of them to choose from. Like probably the most prominent or most important for applications would be nonlinear optics, where if you send light through some optical fiber, then the light in that fiber can form these sort of solitons, and therefore your signal or whatever can stay in shape. What I'll talk about exclusively today are matter waves, in particular Bose Einstein condensates, in which, again, due to some nonlinearity, non you can sustain these solitons. But they're also known in material physics or in biology as sort of properties of uh, uh, DNA chains. And also recently, I saw something in the context of general relativity. Right? So, since nonlinear equations are all over the place, and a nonlinear wave equation is all I need to have a soliton, simply speaking, right? so you can find them in lots of different systems. Now, when I talk about quantum solitons, right, so essentially what I've shown you over here would be classical solitons. Right? You have just one wave equation for one, one sort of thing that is waving, like here the surface of the water, or in the, sorry, in the optical setting, the ele electric field in the, of the light and the fiber. Right, so that would be what I call a classical soliton. But now, in many cases, this is actually made out of quantized constituents of a quantum field. Right? So for example, your light in the fiber, the electromagnetic field, actually comes from photons, as we all know. There are then photon shot noise fluctuations. And that all makes the soliton quantum. Right? So when it is made out of a quantum field of different quanta, such like photons. Right? And either the quantum or the classical soliton has, has a bunch of applications that are of interest for technology. Right, so the most prominent one is fiber optical communications. Right, so apparently people have sent uh, solitons all the way from New York to Paris. Or, so I actually think these are routinely used in fiber optic communication. Or if you go to atoms, they have been proposed in interferometry, for example, to do atom interferometers and now measure gravity using these solitons. Right, so there is already with the classical solitons, there is a bunch of technological applications. And then, as usual, when we make them quantum, maybe we can have even cooler applications. Right? But I'm really actually more interested in them from a fundamental point of view. Right? So now, if we have these solitons, and one thing I'll be interested on is if we collide them, is it possible that these uh, quantum fluctuations change the way they collide? Let's first look at how they collide when there's no quantum fluctuations. So what you see here as a function of position and of time is the atom density in two of these colliding solitons. <coughs> 
right? And one key feature, I'm sorry, I explain these things in more detail very shortly, but one key feature of a soliton is that when they collide, something complicated may happen, but they again perfectly retain their shape, right? So in a, in a soliton collision, it still stays a soliton. If you think of it, that's actually slightly surprising, given that I said it has to be in a nonlinear medium, right? So if you look at this line, for example, you could say, okay, maybe there's just some sort of interference going on, right? So I have two wave packets, they go through each other, and then they retain their shape. And because of the superposition principle, nothing happened in the collision. But I don't have a superposition principle, right? So it's one nice and special feature of solitons that despite all this complicated nonlinearity, they retain their shape in a collision. Right, so now the key question throughout the talk is, does that get changed by the fact that I actually have to look at these quantum constituents in a quantum soliton? So after this initial motivation, I essentially want to provide you with all the background to hopefully understand what is going on in a, in a bright matter wave soliton collision. And a couple of experiments that seem to indicate that not all there is understood, right? Or I advocate the position that not everything in these is understood. And then I want to sort of highlight two features that we have found out why these collisions do indeed get strongly modified by quantum, um, quantum anybody effects. And also in the most recent one, that if you just send two of these quantum solitons together, you let them collide, they more or less entangle themselves, right? So there is entanglement all over the place. And of course, particularly in this setting, right? So that could potentially with more understanding and more control again, be an interesting resource for quantum technologies. Right, so a Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, simply speaking, just means I have a bunch of bosons and I cool them all the way down to nearly absolute zero temperature. Right, so at classical, say, room temperatures, typically of any sort of atom or molecule, your de Broglie wavelength is so short that for all practical purposes, you can think of your atoms as just sort of classical marbles here floating around in space. They're all at a well-defined position and with a well-defined momentum. Right, so now as we are cooling the system to lower and lower temperatures, you know the thermal velocity and therefore the thermal momentum of each atom becomes smaller and smaller. Right, because of that, their quantum mechanical de Broglie wavelength becomes larger and larger, right, until invariably at some temperature you reach a corner where now these wavelengths are so large that they start touching the neighboring atom. Right, so these wavelengths now begin to overlap. Right, so whenever that happens, it starts to matter whether these guys are bosons or fermions. And then it so happens that when they're bosons, ultimately at the very lowest temperature, they all start occupying the same wave, right? sort of the ground state of the system. Right? So, and all these possibly thousands of bosons go into there. Right, so that has been observed now uh, many, many times and 20 years ago in experiments. Right, so essentially what this shows is this famous first uh, movie of Bose-Einstein condensation, where this is above the critical temperature for Bose-Einstein condensation, you have some broad distribution of velocities, right? So this is a picture of the velocity distribution of that gas. And in this absolute ground state, essentially only the lowest available velocity state is occupied, simply speaking. Now, for a theorist, uh, that is particularly nice because I have a relatively simple description of the problem, right? So if I didn't have Bose-Einstein condensation, this is the quantum many-body problem. I have to write a Hamiltonian, I have to use a field operator, and all of this becomes really scary and nasty, right? So instead of that, you know that then in that setting also my wave function for n particles would in fact be a wave function that has three n coordinates o over here, sorry, right? So I have one position for each particle. Uh, that's a very complicated object theoretically. Right now, once all the atoms have Bose-Einstein condensed into the same state, this I can write down mathematically like this, right? So now my many-body many wave function just says, I take the n-fold product of this one function where all my, the one quantum state that all my atoms now occupy, and I use it for all the atoms, right? So they're all in the same state. And then it should be, intuitively reasonable that the only thing I have to describe theoretically is this one state, right? So I have one wave function now, maybe occupied by 100,000 atoms, and I only have to do theory for that one wave function, right? So that is called the mean field wave function, and there is a known equation for it that is called gross pitaevsky equation that essentially governs how this mean field wave function that all my 100,000 Bose-Einstein condensed bosons occupy, 
how that uh, changes in time. And I'm going to use that relatively a lot through the talk. So I first remind you by looking at it, it really looks just like the time-dependent Schrödinger equation that I'm assuming everyone is knowing. Right? So there is a kinetic energy term. There is an external trapping potential. Right? So let's say here we have this harmonic trap in violet line that all these 100,000 atoms are now trapped in. And the only thing that's new, really, is this nonlinear term here that's due to atomic collisions. Right? So there is 100,000 atoms. That's not like one atom. So any two atoms can collide. Right? And it so happens that in the regime we're interested in, these collisions are actually really, really simple to describe. It's called the S-wave scattering limit, but that's not important. Right? So in the end of the day, because of these simplifications, you can look at collisions by just adding this nonlinear term, where importantly this mod phi squared of this wave function occupied by all the atoms, because it's occupied by all the atoms, now essentially it's normalized to the number of atoms. And because of that, this mod phi squared is the atomic number density. Right? So this should make some sense that the collision energy is proportional to the density of other atoms there, which, which I can collide, times some constant, g, which is positive for repulsive interactions between the atoms and negative for attractive interactions between the atoms. Right? So here, this collisions, this is individual atoms colliding. And now I want to slowly move us towards entire solitons made out of thousands of atoms colliding which is a different thing. Any questions up to here? I forgot to say that at the beginning, feel free to interrupt me anytime you have a question. Okay. Right, so take home message maybe for now, right? So this Bose-Einstein condensate generally, one would hope, can be described with mean field theory, which is just like Schrodinger's equation plus a nonlinear term. Right, and I had told you we need a nonlinear term to have a soliton. Now we can see relatively neatly why or how. Right, so if I have nothing else, no trap, I just have one dimension. Right, and I th therefore this mean field equation for the Bose-Einstein condensate now has a kinetic energy term and this nonlinearity. And I had said for negative g, which is exclusively what I look at now, that means the atoms themselves like to attract. Right, so now you can imagine if you have a certain waveform like this, Right, so if we make this a lot more spiky, and right, right, so it comes together and becomes very high at the center, so the atoms clump together, that gives you a much larger negative energy. Right, so it's energetically favorable for this term here to pull this waveform together. Right, whereas you know the kinetic energy term likes to push it apart. Right, so everyone has seen that in their quantum mechanics 101 lecture, that you have a Gaussian wave packet, and you have this free particle Schrodinger equation, which is exactly the same like the orange underlined one, your Gaussian wave packet will flow apart, right? Because of dispersion in the system. Right, and now it should be maybe logical that we can find a certain waveform where these two effects exactly cancel, right? So one of them likes to spread it apart, the other one likes to pull it together. And the solution for that, one can relatively easily see by plugging it into here and finding out left-hand side is zero that has this sort of secant hyperbolic shape, like that's a one on cosine hyperbolic, which is what I've shown here, right? Don't worry about the formula. A soliton looks like this, in a bright soliton in a BEC, right? It's called bright soliton, one second, because there's a density increase and another type of soliton would be a decrease, yes? Why is there no trap in Schrodinger? Because I didn't want one. I could add it. You don't, I mean, the key point is these atoms trap themselves, right? Because they attract. Right, so they, once they form that waveform, you don't need a trap potential to keep them in place. Right? I could add that trap again here in the equation. And then, of course, technically this mathematically would look like slightly different. Right? But in practical purposes, it's not important. In fact, I will mostly not have, OK, not, not true. Half of my talk, I'll have a trap. Half of the talk, I won't. I have to just kind of find out that this is a bright soliton in a Bose-Einstein condensate, it's better you don't have one. Any other questions? Okay. So they have been experimentally implemented as early as 2002. I'm showing you a slightly older picture of one in an experiment, right? So this is a Bose-Einstein condensate of 15,000 atoms, where they have used some tricks to make the atoms attract. And this is an uh, absorption image of all these atoms in your cloud, right? So they're essentially very tightly trapped in this direction and much less tightly trapped in this direction so that we can get away with a one-dimensional equation, 
Uh, one thing you notice here, this is all in 1D. Uh, of course, real life is 3D. I get back to that shortly. Uh, for now, we just have this soliton here in one dimension. And if you take a cut through that 2D figure, you see something like this. And then given that experimental pictures are always much more ugly than theory ones, sorry to the experimentalists in the audience, uh, right? So then obviously this is uh, as close as we get. Yeah? So this can be done and theory works out. Also what works out, say here again, you see these sort of density snapshots of a uh, meta wave wave packet. You see here, this is the soliton with G being negative, right? You see it mostly doesn't change shape up to say experimental precision. Whereas if G is zero, so they don't interact, here you see that sort of dispersing Gaussian that flattens out from your quantum 101 lecture. Right? Okay, so let's say, uh, hopefully we know now what a bright soliton in a Bose-Einstein condensate is about, right? And that they can be done in experiments. Now, my talk focuses on collisions of these. I told you they collide without changing shape. Right, so let's first set the stage for having them collide. Right? All of that can again be described by the same mean field equation. Yeah? All I do now is I put two solitons in it and kick them towards each other. Right? So here I've sketched these two solitons. Let's say we have a left soliton and a right soliton, L and R. I'll use that notation a couple of times later. I give them some velocity initially, and then at some point they might work together here like in this dashed line. Right, so their starting point is two solitons far away, such that later on they will collide. One important aspect I can put in now, because I have, right, so the whole Bose-Einstein condensate is just described by one wave function, right? So like one single particle quantum system. And you know wave functions are complex numbers, right? So that means I can now put a relative complex phase between the left soliton and the right soliton, right? So essentially that means I can make an in-phase soliton Right, where my wave function is plus plus, or out of phase, where it's plus minus, or other things in between. Right, and it turns out that this very critically affects how they collide. If, right, so here you see the blue shade again. Right, so I have many, many of these plots. Here is position, here is time. The blue shade is the density of atoms. Right, and since it doesn't flow apart, this density bump, right, so we know it's a soliton. Right, and here you can see these, these pink lines, think of them as just the center line for guidance for the eye. Right, so evidently the, in, the collision looks very different for these two phases. And by just looking at the lines here would say they collide repulsively, they repel in the collision, and here they attract. Right, and I could make that even more extreme by I could give them no initial velocity and they still would sort of pull each other in. Right, so they really attract. Any questions to know? Okay, but so the key message is that for the classical soliton, right, it's a bit confusing because I talked about the quantum anybody wave function earlier, right? But because essentially I just have one nonlinear wave equation and there's no meaning here anymore of individual atoms making this up, right? So I'd call this thing a classical soliton. I could equally well have it in a light field or whatever, right? Or on a water wave. So in this case, the collision is fully governed by that relative phase. Okay, one, so, so far everything was one dimensional. Mostly I try to keep stay one dimensional, right? So like I said earlier, the, the reason we think we can stay one dimensional is in experiments, pretty much all the ones I care about, you have all these 100 to 10,000 atoms trapped in a very, very cigar shaped trap, right? Or a very, very tight trap, right? So it's like they can move as much as they like along the long direction and they almost can't move at all transversely to that. Right, so that's what we call a quasi one dimensional trap. This is actually not a very good. Ex what do you mean by that bright? Uh, the like? bright? Oh, bright? So bright as opposed to dark. I am not talking about dark. There are dark solitons. Uh -huh. That's essentially the opposite. Right? So you have some density everywhere, and then you have a density dip, and then it goes back to non zero density. And for that, you need G bigger than zero. Mm -hmm. And Regis can you tell you lots of things about it? But I will not talk about dark solitons at all, right? So, in uh, right, so if if anyway my atoms almost cannot move in this direction, it might make some sense that I get away instead of writing a three-dimensional Gauss-Petersky equation here, 
or mean field equation. I just write the one dimensional version. Right? So this vector r is x, y, z. And I only keep x and I ignore y and z. That is mostly fine, except when these solitons attractively interact, then for a short while they make this huge density bump in the center. And it so happens that in 3D, actually, not every bright soliton would be stable. Right? So there, there's something at very, very high densities. You just start losing all the atoms and it blows up. Right? So essentially, in one, sorry, OK, I explained that wrongly. So in, in one dimension, this is always the solution, no matter how many atoms you have. It just becomes narrower and narrower. Yeah, in three dimensions, there is a critical number. Right? If you exceed that critical number, then, then your soliton just sort of self-contracts and blows up and dies. Right? So that will be important to interpret some experiments I want to talk about. Otherwise, I'm not doing any 3D calculations, luckily. OK, now, how do they make those in experiments? Right, so essentially, you cannot really handle very nicely repulsive Bose-Einstein, sorry, attractively interacting Bose-Einstein condensates because of that collapse that I just said. Right, if, if they were attractive and you try to cool them to very low temperatures, at some point they'll just blow up, most likely. Right, it can be done, but it's messy, as far as I understand. So what most experiments do is they do it indirect. They first make a repulsively interacting Bose-Einstein condensate, and then they change interactions using some tricks to be attractive. And this is a simulation of that sort of process. Right, so here at the beginning, essentially, this, this bright thing is just my very one, very longly elongated uh, Bose-Einstein condensate for repulsive interactions. And now at time zero, in the simulation or experiment, we have switched the interactions to be attractive. Right, so now you see this, like the, the, the whole elongation was because the atoms had pushed each other out. Right, it was repulsive. So now repulsion is no longer there. Instead, there's attraction. So this whole thing contracts like this. Right? So the atoms are pulling each other in now, more and more. Right? And what you then see is at some point, there are some sort of lumps are forming over here. Where is it? There and there. Right? And the lumps are getting bigger and bigger. And these lumps are forming then into solitons. Right? So essentially, this creates what is called a soliton train through a process that's called modulational instability that I don't really want to go into. Right? So essentially, at this point, we would have five or six unclear, relatively nicely formed solitons out of this initially kind of very widely separated BC. And then, but there are still like this whole thing was in a harmonic trap in this direction. Right? So there was a potential like this. So they're all still falling inwards, and then they collide with their neighbor. and natively at that point sort of these soliton collisions do happen right there's nothing you can do about it see so in the later stages of this train formation they collide and in fact then they can bounce back and keep colliding and it goes on and off like this Everything clear so far okay so this is one such experiment where they have done this they do then some direct observation of these Bose-Einstein condensed clouds with solitons each of these blobs is a soliton this is the early time towards later times. And you see they do this sort of contract, like I said, in the trap. And while it's not entirely clear, you sort of get the impression that mostly they behave repulsively with their neighbors. Right? You don't really see this merging, making one huge spike, attractive collision in there that much. And there are some even more extreme experiments in that regard. So this is a very uh, earlier one. Say they've done two solitons out of one of these collapse scenarios, like I've shown. These two solitons are formed in a harmonic trap, and then they sort of bounce in and out. Right? So they fall in, they collide, they repel. And they keep doing this. When they're in, they can't really see properly. So essentially what is shown here is the overall width of the atomic distribution in this direction. Right? So it's large, small, large, small. And it's oscillating here for 200 milliseconds, and then here the scale shifts to three seconds, three and a half seconds. So for up to three seconds, these two solitons are bouncing happily in and out, in and out. A two-soliton system is symmetric, right? So that initial state was symmetric. Two solitons should be symmetric. The relative phase should be zero. Right? So if anyone remembers what I told you about relative phase zero, means they should attractively interact. And the numbers here are such that when they attractively interact, they should, should implode. It should be unstable. Right, so essentially, the fact that these guys are merrily bouncing for three seconds off each other 
has been interpreted such that they interact repulsively. Uh, sadly, there is really no reason to, or the theory cannot properly explain why they do that. There have been people who okay, that must mean for some reason they have that pi phase difference that makes them interact repulsively. Right? But they don't, there is really no theory reason. And a simulation, right? I can simulate that in the same way like the movie I've shown you, that does not happen. Right? It does not happen and it shouldn't. Sorry, no, if, I mean, so if they were interacting repulsively, this uh, is fine, right? So they, they come, they're in a trap, two solid ones, right? They accelerate, they bounce off each other, they go back to the turning point, they keep doing this. That's logical, right? So now the, the point is there is really no explanation why they would be interacting repulsively in that scenario, right? Also the simulation, if I simulate the entire experiment, simulation shows they should have a zero phase difference and they should in between collapse. We've done that simulation in the older paper. Okay. To make matters worse, matters worse regarding me convincing people that these solitons don't collide as expected. Most people think they do. Right, so there's a recent experiment here in Nature Physics where they've not done this sort of brutal collapse kind of scenario. Instead, they have just very carefully prepared two solitons. So they have taken a BC, carefully moved it into two pieces, carefully changed interaction strengths while, while they're separated in two traps and then only let it collide. And then they've, and, and, and in situ very carefully look at how they collide, right, while they collide. And they find these two types of dynamics. And this one on the left, you say, okay, that in between it forms one blob, right, so that's my attractive interaction. Here it always remains two blobs, so that's my repulsive interaction. And then I say this had phase zero and this had phase pi. All is good. Uh, one, one caveat, so what they, what they also describe in the paper, what they see is a random mix of this and this and other things right, in that experiment. And now after seeing what they see, they decide, okay, this was zero, this was pi. Right? So there is no meaning of knowing zero or pi beforehand. That will be important later in what I explain. Right? So essentially my, my take on the experimental state of affairs about whether solitons collide, whether matter wave solitons collide as predicted by mean field theory or not is, let's say it's mixed. There are some aspects that seem to sort of work out. There are some other aspects, some of them very strong, that seem to suggest something very strong in non-mean field must be going on. Right? And essentially since now, what, 15 years? <laughs> Thanks to Matthew Davis infusing me with the idea, we are trying to figure out what is going on here. Right? And that I want to share with you today. Any questions up to you? Yep. What stops them from merging? Good question. Right? So in I'll show you later some model in which they actually can also merge. It's just normally they don't, right? So in, in this equation that formally carries soliton solutions, this is not what they do because they're solitons. Solitons, by definition, right, so they collide, they retain their shape. It means they don't merge, and but that would change the shape, right? Then you suddenly have a much bigger soliton. Right? It's a good question, right? But so right now it's the mathematics of this model where that doesn't happen. And I'll show you later cases where it does. That's clearly here, they also they repel, so they don't merge. Here it's much less obvious. Good question. I'll say something about it later. Any other questions? Energetic studies uh, can go on further. Further or later? Some double well kind of potential you were saying. Double well potential. I was showing cartoons of double ah, well. Yeah. Huh? I mean, so this is during the, that's when I said they very carefully prepare this two soliton system, which means they start with one, one BEC here, mm -hmm. split up into two, make attractive into soliton, mm -hmm. remove this again so they can collide. Uh -huh. Are you right? Like if here I'm just looking at the ground state, I'll get some sort of double well stuff going on. Like I think, right, so the splitting is so large that these are really independent, mm -hmm. right? And that, okay. that will be important also in my interpretation later, right? So you just make two separate BECs that don't know of each other. Other questions? Yes, yes, right? But in the, it, it's a little bit of a weird system, I guess, right? You think quantum mechanically, 
like they all there is that soliton mode. So there's a wave function like shaped like the soliton that these atoms sit in and they remain in that. Right? But nonetheless, microscopically they're colliding of each other. Right? And that then is encoded. Right? So microscopically we are not following them. Right? So the 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 scales in everything here are such that essentially the separation of one atom from the next is so 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 much larger than the than the range of the potential. It's like you never have to look at two of these atoms colliding. Right? So essentially, you assume my atom has this wave function that's shaped like a soliton. It can collide with others. I'm not looking at the details of that. But because of that, I'm getting that negative nonlinear term here, which is super crucial to getting a soliton. Yeah. Yeah. But the similar thing can happen with one soliton to another Yes. Yeah. I mean, so these are contact interactions, right? So the, the way you're getting this is essentially you assume your range of interactions is zero, right? You put a delta function as your interaction potential, right? So in that model, I would say they really only interact with themselves. So for another soliton to interact with another soliton, you need to be a little bit in this scenario like these dashed lines here, right? So once their tails overlap a bit, then that effect that you mentioned starts to happen. Before that, it shouldn't. OK. So uh, just to finish that introduction bit, I think. Right, so of course, theo like the in theory, it's comparatively easier to uh, figure out, does mean field theory work? Because we can just go beyond it. Right, so we do a non-mean field theory calculation. These guys have done that using something called MCDDHB that I don't want to go into. It's just right, so a much more sophisticated method than this mean field theory I was using so far. They looked at a sort of attractive collision and realized, oh, that totally changes things. Right? This sort of attracts a bit, but then actually repels at the center. Right? So that's one indication, OK, something might indeed totally change when you do non-mean field. We were also dabbling with that in earlier life. Right? So what you see here in red are all these individual solitons from one of these collapses. And while we couldn't quite put our finger on, right? so this is mean field, this is some beyond mean field method. Right, so it all looks a little more repulsive to me. Right, maybe easier to see closer up. Right, so here certainly there are all these like mergers and uh, very very strongly attractive looking things, and this seems to be all a bit pushed out and not so attractive. We couldn't quite nail it down at the time, but it kept us going. Okay, so that was sort of the background. So uh, essentially now I want to explain you why I think indeed uh, due to non-mean field effects, whenever you look at any of these two solitons this phase, 0 or pi, of that should govern the collision, stops having any meaning shortly after some time, after some so-called uh, phase diffusion time. Right? And like I said, for that, we have to give up on this nice and simple mean field theory and go beyond. So we can no longer write our many body wave function as just n atoms are in the same state phi. Right, but also, I don't want to have too much notation or too many equations, so I try to minimize it somewhat. Right, so essentially, we write a quantum field model. It's sort of like a two-mode model from quantum optics, uh, where I say, essentially, atoms can be either in the left or right soliton, but when they're in the soliton, they're just in that same shape like the soliton has to have. Right, so I have a spatial mode, L of x, that's the blue line, or R of x, that's the pink line. Each of them has a destruction operator attached Right, that means now I can have a varying number of atoms in the soliton. Right, I have a quantum state later on, right, the occupation number state that says, OK, there's the superposition of 5 and 10 and 20 atoms in the left soliton. Yeah, all of that I do not have in mean field theory. In mean field theory, I have a fixed number of atoms in the soliton. Uh, yeah. How many atoms exactly in the soliton? That depends on the soliton. The ones that we'll talk about throughout, uh, like mostly we've been looking at are uh, 28,000. If there's more atoms, it becomes narrower, right? So because of the, you increase this nonlinear attraction, right? So the, the actually, the, ne the, the more atoms you put in, the more relatively narrow it becomes, right? So this shape changes. It's a very good point, right? So there's, here I've written some uh, sech of x divided by xi, right? So this xi parameter becomes smaller, smaller if you increase your atom number, right? And We've been mostly trying to explain, uh, say, this experiment. Uh, 
uh, or, sorry, not that one, this one, sort of target that one. And I think here the atom number was about 28,000 per soliton. So do they really limit themselves? Yes, because like I said, in, like if it at some point becomes, there is, in reality it's 3D. And in 3D, if you have too many atoms, it collapses. Right, so there is a practical limit. If you really were in a 1D universe, there would not be. Right, in, in reality there is. And I, I think that's pretty close here, 28, and probably the limit is 40, 50, 60, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so our, like, we essentially use three ways to go beyond uh, mean field theory. First one is that sort of two-mode model where you have a spatial shape, shaped like the soliton that doesn't change. And now the only thing that can change is how many atoms are in each soliton. Then we use this MCTDHB, which more or less is looking the same, except it has a way to also change the shape of each soliton depending on how many atoms are inside of it. Like we just said, that in principle should be there. And finally, we use something like that is called truncated Wigner approximation that just amounts to take my mean field wave function, add some random noise on top of it in a very specified way. So it, now, now my two solitons look like this. And you can show, if I had another 40 minutes, that that way we can somehow find quantum field observables by averaging over many, many simulations with different random noise on top. Right? Such like, like say this is a phase correlation function Right, so field operator at x and x prime, expectation value thereof tells you sort of how coherent is my bosonic field between x and x prime. And I find that by just taking this sort of random simulation wave function at x and x prime, and the line here means average over 20,000 simulations. I don't want to go into the details of that. I'll just show you the output. You can ask me if you want details. So now we can first take the simplest one, this two-mode model. We say we have two solitons. I plug that into my Hamiltonian. I spare you all the details. And we find a sort of effective Hamiltonian that people would know perhaps from quantum optics, right? So this is just a two-mode problem. I have a creation and destruction operator for the left soliton and for the right one. And you get that nonlinear term because of the collisions of the atoms among the each other. And you get a possible transfer term where the atom can now sort of tunnel or hop from one soliton to the other. But this really only happens when they're very, very close. Right? As soon as they're too far away, then clearly that can no longer happen. Uh, but, but this is, a, and, and this is what we want to do actually now first look, the solitons are very far away from each other. What happens then? So essentially then I can understand most things by just looking at one coherent state. Right? So this is your formula for coherent state in uh, say quantum optics, right? So it's a superposition of lots of different numbers of atoms in one soliton, right? So n here means I have little n atoms in my say left soliton. I can make a represent, like so essentially write a phase space representation of that in some sort of phase space for this operator A and A dagger that are here governing my atoms in the soliton. So let me again just run you through the interpretation. Right, so this is this ball and stick diagram from quantum optics. Right, essentially, in the radial direction of this 2D space, that's atom number. Right, so I'm trying to write a quantum state in phase space. The further out I am, that means my atom number. Right, and then where I am in the complex plane is actually the complex phase of this mean field wave function. Right, so therefore, if I have one soliton over here and one soliton over here, the relative angle between the two, that's the relative phase between that left and right soliton. Right? And one can interpret all this mean field theory we have been doing by just saying, okay, my, my many body quantum state is a many mode coherent state. That means the coherent state for each x. I separately put a coherent state. Then I get my mean field wave function and everything is nice and simple. Yeah, however, now we want to do a little better. Let's say, suppose we had the coherent state in each of the solitons and we have this Hamiltonian. What happens then? Right, that is actually well known what happens then, just people haven't realized what it does to the solitons. Right, so here I'm showing you the calculation. Right, so again, what I'm formally showing is the Q function of my quantum state. Again, just think of what I just said. Right, so outside is atom number, 
angle re with respect to the center is phase of that state. Right? And now as time goes on, maybe further from the back, hard to see, right? So you see this thing sort of sharing a little bit, right? So there was a blob initially, and now the outer part of the blob is moving faster in this rotation, right? What, what, why it's rotating is just your usual quantum mechanical e to the minus i energy t divided by h bar, right? So things in quantum mechanics circle around in the complex plane. But this energy now depends on the atom number, right? And I said atom number is outwards. Right, that means the outermost part of the blob is going faster than the inner blob, right? And because of that, it's sharing, right? You might recognize this as a squeeze state in the early stages of its life, right? So somewhere around uh, here, ah. maybe here it would be a squeeze state, right? And at the very end product, after long enough time, essentially the, the Q function of this state looks like this. It's covering all the place. Right, now, my interpretation of that means this quantum state no longer has a well-defined phase. Right, so this phase distribution is everywhere from 0 to 2 pi, all over the place. Yeah, so the soliton has lost its phase. Now I have two solitons that both lost their phase. They also lost their relative phase. Right, that should be clear. Like If already one soliton, I can no longer fix the complex phase. My relative phase is gone. Right, so this, this process is called phase diffusion. And it's been invented long before we came along. Right, so but now our realization is because of that, the soliton uh, lose their kind of ability to have a well-defined relative phase. In the interest of time, which I think I'm running very short of, uh, let me skip this. Right, so that gives rise to something called fragmentation that these people had noticed earlier in one of their beyond mean field work. Let me skip that. So since I said this uh, relative phase governs how collisions work, and now we lost it, right? So you would expect if you collide solitons much, be much before they fragment, right? So from now on, I just use fragmentation for phase diffusion has happened. And what phase diffusion is, I told you, fragmentation I skipped, right? So I collide them before phase diffusion, zero phase, attractive, pi phase, repulsive, all is good. I collide them after phase diffusion, all of it looks repulsive using one of these beyond mean field methods, right? So it seems that sort of average over all the possible phases already significantly modifies collision behavior. Okay. How much more time do you give me? 10 minutes. Okay, I think that might work. Okay, so now I mean, so we partially, I'll tell you later on why we didn't yet fully understand what's going on, but certainly say there's some progress, right? So this whole dependence of collisions on the phase no longer perfectly governs the show. I want to tell you now that something even more exciting is actually happening in this collision, which we got sort of pushed towards understanding by just use of these beyond mean field theories. I have shown you this, system, this thing earlier, that uh, real life is 3D. Yeah, we just want to make our life simple, so we look at 1D mostly. However, uh, some, uh, so some people have derived a way to neatly take into account that effectively, I mean, there, there is three-dimensional universe. We should worry about it occasionally. So assuming that only during a collision, maybe atoms might virtually go into a transversely excited state and then come back, without that I either want to nor could go into the details, they derived that that then gives rise to this modified mean field uh, equation. Up to here, it's the same, right? So cubic just counts the total number of phi's here, one, two, three. So the normal nonlinearity is cubic, and now you get an additional quintic term. And that comes from, that essentially would mean a three-body three, three collision involving three atoms. And let's believe the authors of this paper that that somehow comes about by these transverse modes that are virtually accessed during the collision. This breaks the model being integrable, and that opens the door for all sorts of exciting things. First thing is boring, right? So if you now look at your soliton, Right, th th these guys have looked at what happens to the soliton in this model. It changes from the red line to the blue line. I mean, it changes somehow, of course, but mostly it doesn't really dramatically change how it looks like, would be my takeaway from this. Right, that's for some realistic parameters like in the experiment. Right, so the, the, quint the, the blue one is the quintic model soliton. However, what is rather dramatic is what happens in collisions. Right, so if you have only the cubic nonlinearity like we had so far, Soliton collisions are always elastic, right? So two solitons come in, 
they go out with the same number of atoms and they go, go out with the same velocity that they came in with. If you're adding that quintic interaction or three-body collision, this really dramatically changes collisions. Firstly, here you see one that almost looks like this. But if you look in detail, this is much brighter and this is much darker red. And that means this one has gained atoms. Right? So atoms now have transferred from one soliton to the other. And this one consequently is slower and this one is faster. I'll talk much more about that later. And the other things that happen, some, someone you had asked earlier, right? so now they can merge. Right? So somehow the integrability of that quint, uh, cubic model prohibits such things. But in real life, which this is closer to, because we're taking into account th three dimensions, solid cons can merge. Right? And that has been extensively studied by these two people. And we have mostly tried to stay away from that. Something else that can happen is solitons can excite breathing modes. So they essentially collide. And if you were sitting about here, then you could see that on this line, there is some sort of bright spots. So essentially, that soliton is doing like this after the collision. Right? It went into a breathing mode. So we want, essentially, we try parameters where this doesn't happen as much. And if it happens, we cut it out. And I justify that later. Right? Because I really want to just stay with binary soliton collisions that I find confusing enough for me. So main thing, like I said, what happens now is atoms can jump from one soliton to the other. And maybe I can skip this also in the interest of time. We understood why that happens only after they are phase diffused. Let me skip that. Right, but so what these results are showing, the A is the relative number of atoms in the left and right soliton. Like someone was asking me, soliton has 28,000 atoms. Right, so if this relative number goes from the, the violet dotted line that was initially before the collision, this is my number distribution. Right, so because of the noise I'm adding into the simulation, I don't always have the same number, but it's very close to 28,000. After the collision, it fans out to these like red, black, magenta curves. That's for different parameters, doesn't matter. Right, but you see the scale is of the order of 5,000, 10,000. That's two thirds of the atoms in a soliton. Right, so they really massively can transfer from one to the other soliton. And that's independent of the phase, but it happens only after this fragmentation slash phase diffusion. Now what happens if they jump from one to the other? So I already said, right, we have momentum conservation in this problem. Right? And initially, because they're all stuck in one soliton, they go with the same velocity. Let's assume they have the same number of atoms in each soliton. So my initial momentum, one going left, one going right, is zero. Right? So now say A atoms jump from the pink soliton to the blue soliton. This one is therefore heavier, this one is lighter, and therefore to balance momentum, this one must go slower and this one must go faster. Right? That is just momentum conservation. However, now I, if, I, if I now think about this in terms of a quantum, quantum many body state, I go slightly crazy. Right? So I would now claim that the post collision many body state must be something like this. Yeah, this means post collision many body state. This means quantum state, whatever it is of the left soliton containing n plus a atoms and having a velocity matching that according to energy momentum conservation. And this means right soliton having minus a atoms fewer and the corresponding velocity. Right? So these velocities are whatever you infer from this diagram. And all of this is in a quantum coherent superposition depending on how many atoms actually have transferred. Right? We have a quantum model for this transfer. So we can get a superposition of all sorts of different numbers of atoms during this collision. And so my cartoon propaganda picture for this would be like that. Right? So my two solitons with four atoms each come in. And here, sort of, this one has five in the end, and this one has three. So the red, the magenta, and the blue solitons are all paired up in one of these terms that are added up in that sort of weird many-body entangled state. Right? And our claim would be this happens all by itself. You just have to collide them. And they are entangled. Ta-da. Right? So now we wanted to nail that down a little bit better using these truncated Wigner simulations where we do two solitons plus noise plus that quintic interaction. And effectively, adding the noise rand randomizes quite a lot of things. It randomizes the initial relative phase a little. It randomizes the initial velocity a little. And it randomizes individual atom numbers. Right? So all of these are now slightly distributed. And then what you see is what I've explained before. These are individual trajectories that the PhD student made a movie of, of this, like, Simulation with lots of different noise, right? And you see all these cases I said earlier, 
right? Weird mergers, and they are sort of essentially scattering out with all these different velocities. Yeah? Truncated Wigner, in principle, the statement is these, these things, you shouldn't really interpret too much into them. Some people, including us, say it's like a single experiment. But really, formally, we should always average this over many trajectories, and that gives us physical observables. And then the average shows you correspondingly this. They come in nicely. Where they come out, it's sort of blurred up here. Right? So the density is spread over different outgoing velocities. And because I don't want to be confused about mergers, we have removed all trajectories where there's a merger. As I say, in the experiment, you detect to have one or two solitons, you throw away everything that has one. That's why there's that weird cutoff in the color here. OK, maybe in the last two and a half hours. Um, so, so now this, this quantum state is contains entanglement. Sorry, where did I lose it? The quantum state contains entanglement in both momentum or velocity and number. Right, so people in the literature have, have called such a thing hyper-entangled. Right, so now we wanted to show some easy criteria that in the simulation we indeed have these hyper-entangled states. Right, and let me jump over the derivations. Essentially, you can show that uh, essentially if you have a separable number state for atoms in the left and right soliton, then you have that sort of symmetric number distribution. And in the end of the day, so th this is your total number, and this is your relative number uncertainty, and they have to be equal, and they have to stay as they are. Right? And essentially what we find in the simulation is, initially, they are equal. So violet is the total number distribution. Green is the relative number distribution, like right? difference of number in the left and right soliton. After the collision, I've shown you that fans up like crazy. Right? So we can claim, as long as we have a pure state, as long we, as we have a pure state, this is entangled in number. And we can find some similar poor man's criteria for momentum entanglement, but that should be obvious, right? So it's sort of superposition of all these different outgoing momenta. As long as it's quantum coherent, that will be entangled. So both these things are entangled. Now, just going back to these experiments, right? So, so I don't think like any of those have, I mean, they may have seen this entanglement without noticing or paying attention to it. I would think it's there. Right, but no one has looked at it yet. Let's go back to these collision properties. Right, so when we put the numbers in for that nicely controlled experiment that seems to agree with GP a little here and there. So this is pre-fragmented. Right, so they essentially do this very slow preparation. We've mentioned it a few times. Th this is long enough to be fully phase diffused. That means we have a random mix of all relative phases from 0 to 2 pi. This is what they see in the experiment, randomly this or that. In the end, they can attach, OK, this looked like 0, this looked like pi. Right, so that makes sense. Some of these soliton train experiments are a bit harder because their preparation is much faster. So they just make it attractive, it collapses, it makes solitons. It doesn't really have time by our numbers normally to phase diffuse. It does if you put a very high temperature bath here. Like we did the simulation for 300 nanokelvin, then that might work out. So we think because of that collapse being very messy, right, so you're heating up the whole system, it actually is at a high temperature. So I'm also sort of happy with that. The one thing that I'm not happy with yet is this one, where really for sort of three seconds, two solitons have been 100% of the time seemingly repulsively interacting. Right? Because anything I've shown you so, so far still only says, well, the relative phase loses its meaning, and most interactions look repulsive, but most only, not all. Right? So this I still think I cannot explain, and we would like to, so my hunt the white whale kind of operation isn't fully, fully completed yet. OK, with that, li I'd like to just briefly summarize that we are quite convinced that beyond mean field effect very strongly changed soliton collisions, uh, that after this phase diffusion of fragmentation, they're mostly repulsive. Then you enhance, therefore, atom transfer from one soliton to the other, and that causes them to entangle in both momentum and uh, atom number. Right? And just maybe as an extra dot point here in this audience, right? so since we want to talk about quantum technologies, all of this is, of course, a very messy scenario. Right? But now in the future, one could imagine if I can somehow stabilize certain uh, modes of soliton velocity. Right? So I say I want to isolate the blue and the red because I make them somehow preferred. Then maybe I can actually nicely generate an actual usable entangled state of just two different types of soliton. Right? That is, let's say, not totally impossible. Then I'd like to thank uh, the group over the years for their enthusiasm and all of you for your attention. <laughs>
questions? Yeah, and there were many questions before, but I'm happy to answer more if you're not too hungry for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Once you store plugin, go back to the slide you were talking Which? about over and scale and then show the base DP. This or? Uh -huh. So, I mean, if the phase is fully diffused, then the number uncertainty actually reduces. No. Right, so the number uncertainty is the extent of the blob in between this uh, white line, say, and the next white line that I'm not drawing. Right, so it's in the radial direction. Uh -huh. So because the model, the Hamiltonian itself, uh, this one, right, it conserves the total number. It doesn't change the number, right? So the, the number uncertainty is always the radial overall width of that blob thing, and even in the completely phase diffuse state, right, that radial width remained the same. Yeah, it's from here to here. Not anything global. So what happens to the number phase uncertainty? Yeah. Or I you are not bothered about it. I'm not. I'm so. I'm. I'm increasing it, right? So I would think I'm probably not doing anything too bad with it. Like, say the phase has become completely uncertain. Mm -hmm. Number uncertainty hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Assuming that initially, my number phase uncertainty was satisfied, mm -hmm. then it is at the end also even more so. Mm -hmm. Just it had gotten a lot worse. Like. The uncertainty product has increased. Yeah. So phase diffusion helps to remain, uh, keep the soliton intact in a way? Or no, I don't think so. Right. So I mean, none of this. Like, it's, I mean, this picture doesn't look at any interplay between the number state and the mode itself. Right. So I'm essentially, I'm using this very simplistic idea that I have left soliton mode plus operator. Right. So whatever happens here doesn't affect this. If you want to ask, is this keeping it intact or does it do anything to the actual soliton structure? You have to do better, which we can't, don't want to, yeah, mostly can't, right? So it's really, I, I'd say my, my slide here, pretty much to my knowledge, exhausts all possible theories we can do this with. Uh, if I ca can rephrase my questions, this phase diffusion, how it is then connected with the uh, departure from infinity? Can you kind of connect me there? Essentially, I mean, if I, if I in, in mean field theory, I assume the relative phase governs the collision, right? Mm -hmm. So now if I assume at least qualitatively this is still the case in the many body theory that somehow my relative phase governs the collision. But I have just shown that relative phase cease to be meaningful here, right? So now both solitons are like this. Mm -hmm. There is no more relative phase. Then at least say it should be uh, understandable that something massive will change. If I want to look in more detail, right, so in this truncated Wigner method. So here, now I randomize things. So I essentially average over many, many collisions where each simulation itself is like mean field simulation. But it has random noise on top, which means I have random relative phases in the end. Right? I mean, I have first, I have random atom number, because of which the phase also changes in a different way. And in the very end, I have random relative phases. Right? So this sort of gives rise to the interpretation then that once it has phase diffused, what essentially your many body theory is doing is just average over all the possible relative phases. And then have some sort of probability that your collision looks attractive or repulsive. And it so happens that over, the, over that circle of phases, circle of phases, most relative phases are looking repulsive that you can see from mean field theory again. The, the self-interaction, right? your nonlinear term. In the, on the Gross-Pedersky level, your nonlinear term. So if I just take a single solid, just wait for something. Yes. yes. Or any BC. Right? So none of this phase diffusion has nothing to do with solitons and nothing to do with attractive interactions. It just has to do and something with any interactions. Right? Any BC will say phase diffuse. In your model, you're starting with a coherent script, right? Yes. That getting phase diffused. Yes. Yes. So you are starting with a state where the number is not certain yes. and then going towards this state where number becoming more and more certain, the phase getting different. I just like, again, number, number distribution doesn't change. It doesn't become more certain, right? But so if, like, I mean, the, the initial coherent state is for simplicity and because I don't know any better. Right? So there could be, it's certainly not a realistic initial state, perfectly realistic, right? So, but 
qualitatively whatever I talked about will happen for the real estate also. So uh, why, just explain the experimental data. Say again, sorry. Uh, while explaining the experiments, experimental observation, so you told that uh, while preparing this to BC in a double well, we are already getting some, I mean, this is done at a time which is much better than the fragmentation. Yeah. So already it is diffused. Yes. Now, uh, from the experimental observations, you are telling either the, they have a phase like zero or pi. Yes. But uh, is there a restriction? I mean, the phase can be anything. I don't know. Uh, sorry. Okay. Then I explained. Right. So it's not, so they, they see all the possible relative phases, right? So I, I haven't shown you those, but I can do the mean field theory for non-zero or pi phases. And they, then they, you see a little asymmetry in the collision, and it looks still sort of mostly repulsive. And they see those also. Right? So I did not mean to say only 0 or pi, but sort of all the phases are found. And then in the paper, they highlight the two that are clearly 0 and pi. And they also seem to find them with equal probability or whatever. Right? So everything is consistent with my picture, at least, that this experiment creates a pre-phase diffuse state because of the very, very slow preparation and then makes them collide, and then sort of post-selects that, OK, this one looks like phase 0, and this one looks like phase pi. Right? But that, I mean, that is sort of the one thing where I still don't understand. Then, like earlier, we were hoping to find the result. Mean field theory makes, some, makes collisions repulsive, full stop, always. Right? And, and then this shouldn't happen. Right? So that can't quite be the case. Yet. That's also, I haven't shown you anything where that would happen. Right? It just mixes them up. Initial relative phase no longer matters but it doesn't yet make them all repulsive. Any more questions? Okay, last one. This uh, is the voting of the body change, let's say, the transfer is Yes. Is it different using a calculation without the... That is a very good question. No, I don't know. That we should do, in fact. Right, so I mean, uh, so what one thing we tried, so for now we just used this, this guy. I think I like that proposal, right? So of course, like whatever happens here, then one could compare it with the 3D simulation, right? 3D simulations of anything that I talked about are pretty ugly. So I would want to normally avoid that. But I mean, it's a simple enough check that I think one could do. Why is it negative? It comes out of the calculation. I couldn't tell you a sort of, ne so it is, I mean, it, it certainly is always negative. Right, so this Q2 is a positive constant, and minus sign stays there. Right, so that's the way the calculation pops it out, and any physical reason right now off the top of my head. Is there a to collapse even in one piece? Sorry? Elastic. Yeah, so I think that would I, I would expect that it recovers that uh, like critical number again. Right, so that, that should then at some point collapse. And I also think, like you know, this non-polynomial uh, Gospodevsky equation that someone has derived, right? So I, I would, this should be the first term in some expansion of that. We tried that once, that didn't quite work out. So for that reason, I'm actually really interested in your proposal. Let's just compare it once with the 3D. With this last question, so yep. how is the entanglement of difference on the relative That we have not. I think there we were lazy. I must admit, then I don't know, right? So we have just done this, like after figuring out and entangles, right? We've done this for one set of parameters, and uh, or, or I mean, we have discovered it depends non-trivially on the strength of that quintic nonlinearity, but I haven't checked. I mean, the relative phase ultimately no longer matters, right? So this only all happens after it has phase diffused. So I, I would expect initial relative phase is mostly out. Right, but we haven't checked whether that expectation is true. So relative phase is ruled out, but now what distinguishes between whether it will attract or Well, the, presumably the relative, I mean, so in, in any given stochastic trajectory of my non mean field method, it would be the relative phase at the moment of collision, as opposed to relative phase initially. Right, so essentially how you, like here, where was it? Right, so the, the way I think this works, right? Normally, if I have the mean field soliton and I have a symmetric setting and they shoot them together, then they say the relative phase is zero, the relative phase will stay zero, right? 
But now, now you know you have that nonlinear mean field interaction that goes like essentially your energy is like the amplitude squared, right? Clear? In the, in the Gospodarsky equation. Now, if you're adding all that random noise, that essentially means your amplitude is now fluctuating, right? So the am amplitude of the left and right hand side soliton in every single stochastic uh, simulation will be different, right? And that will then scramble your face because it translates into e to the minus i interaction strength amplitude phase factor. That means your relative phase at the moment of collision of these noisy solitons will no longer be the same as at the beginning. So it's right? highly unlikely that they... It, I mean, so that they attract that simply, right? So if you... Uh, sorry. I can do something like, where is it? I can do something like this and scan it over all possible relative phases. That's a mean field simulation, right? And what I found, or what, so I, I don't have a very good mathematical explanation for that, but what seems to be the case that only relatively few phases around zero look like this, with one huge density spike in the center. And most of the other ones, I, I mean, the larger part of from your zero to two pi circle, they look like this. Yeah, they may have a little bit of a density bump here and a dip here, but not really one huge peak. So if I'd say by some definition of attractive means I get a sort of huge density spike in the center, if I put my cutoff right, I would say of your 0 to 2 pi circle, only a relatively small fraction like this would be attractive. It's not negligibly few, no. Just less than repulsive. That made sense? Yes, uh, so if you fix the number of atoms, there won't be any phase diffusion. Yes. I mean, so if, if I fix, if I take it in each soliton, I take a number state, right? You know, because of the number phase uncertainty, that has an undefined phase, and therefore you also have an undefined relative phase. What I can do if I fix the total number of atoms only, not in each soliton, I can do something called a relative coherent state, right? So I have a superposition of different relative numbers with the same fixed total number, and I can still then define a relative phase between the solitons. So then uh, there won't be phase relative. And then also that relative phase will phase diffuse. Right? So having a, an initial uncertain, uncertain total number is not required to look at a defined phase and then phase diffusion. Having an uncertain number in each soliton that you need. Right? If, if that is fixed, then none of them has a phase, then nothing can diffuse. That's like you start phase diffused. Same thing. OK, if there is no more questions, we thank uh, Sebastian. Yeah. Oh, thank you.